before we can commence, we would like to do first things first. We would like to request one of our own, Joe Maila, to give us an opening prayer before we can commence. Over to you, Joe. Let us bow and pray. My Father and my God, in the name of Jesus, we want to take this opportunity just to thank you, Mudimu, for being with us today. And want to believe, dear God, that whatever we're coming to do right here, you shall guide us, Mudimuaka. I pray for every speaker who's going to speak on this podium, my Lord, that you give them wisdom that surpasses all understanding, dear God. Honorable Minister, my colleagues from national departments, my colleagues from the provincial department, my colleagues from the local government, and our media personnel from the community media and also from the mainstream, former colleagues of Roni, good morning. It is a sad day for us as a profession in the public service that we are here maybe to celebrate, but I think also to mourn Roni. I think a number of us have been touched by Roni in various ways. And I think this room says it all. I think Roni touched a number of government officials, but importantly, I think Roni touched the members of the media. I think today, in the next three hours, we will hear a number of stories from some of our officials and also some of the media practitioners in how Roni touched them. Uh, we, our first speaker is from the family who are just going to share with us the life towards the end where Ronnie passed away on sa Saturday evening. He went to Lesotho on the 16th for the inauguration with the DP. Uh, he came back and uh, on the 17th, which, uh, or the 18th, yeah, on Sunday, which was the Father's Day, they organized a, a massage for him at home. And unlike him, he just accepted. He was a very difficult man. He wouldn't accept anything just like that. Uh, when he came back for that massage around uh, six, he was just in a hurry. He said he has got an appointment with the, D with the DP at his home. Uh, he went to that meeting. He came back around uh, 11 in the evening, 11, 12 in the uh, at night. Why am I saying in the evening? At night. Uh, he started reading his newspapers, the Sunday newspapers. Uh, after reading those newspapers, uh, as is requested, uh, that because of he was a heavy, he was a chain smoker, uh, his wife requested him that uh, every time before he comes to bed, he should brush his teeth. So he went to the bathroom to brush the teeth and uh, wash his hands and all of those things. Uh, he didn't come back from the bathroom. He collapsed on his way back from the bathroom. Uh, the wife said that uh, he noticed that the guy didn't come back from the bathroom. So he, she went to check as to whatever that was happening. She found him lying there on the floor. The only thing that he could say was that uh, he cannot breathe. Uh, she called the ambulance and called the son and the helpers in the house to come and assist. So you know, in such instances, you'll think that five minutes would turn into 30 minutes or an hour. 
so they decided that uh, they should pick him up and then they, th they thought that the ambulance was taking forever, you see. So they decided to pick him up. Uh, they realized that the right hand side, the right hand was not uh, functioning properly. It was becoming stiff. Uh, they assisted one another to take him downstairs. So uh, when they reached downstairs, they saw the ambulance lights coming in on that uh, on Trini Street. So uh, the guys from EMS started uh, giving him oxygen, and uh, they even put in a drip on him and then drove to Unitas. When they arrived there at Unitas, uh, they even pumped oxygen again there. He was not speaking at all. Uh, at 10, they took him to theater for the major surgery. They opened on the right hand side because of uh, he had intracranial uh, bleeding on the right hand side. Uh, they sedated him and uh, he was comatose from that day. On the third week, we thought things were coming okay because of they said uh, he will wake up maybe after two or three weeks. So the, on the second week, it was still, the vitals were okay and, and everything was okay. The pressure in the head was coming down because of when he was admitted, the pressure was somewhere around 33. It's supposed to be less than 10. So on the third week, everything was coming okay. It was as if he was coming, he was going to come out of coma. So they discovered that the pressure was now going up in, on the third week. They discovered that uh, they took him for RMI scan, uh, and discovered that there was a clot on the frontal lobe. The first uh, bleeding affected the right hand side of his brain. The second one affected the left hand side of the brain. Uh, they said there was nothing that they can do medically. We then uh, requested uh, Minister Mutsualedi to intervene. He brought in uh, Professor Mukokong on the fourth week, at the, towards the fourth week, uh, Professor Mukokong, and uh, okay, before Professor Mukokong, we asked for a second opinion, <coughs> whereby uh, Professor Kakaza from Steve Biko and some doctors there went and spoke to uh, the neurologist who took him to theater. Uh, they were saying in that direction that uh, what happened, it cannot be reversed and all of those things. So we asked uh, Minister Mutsualedi to come in and uh, he sent in Professor Mokokong. Uh, Professor Mokokong said that uh, what the doctors in UNITAS have done, it was the best. And uh, where the second lot was, they cannot operate at all. And uh, to them, uh, they said that he was now suffering. And uh, it was bad. It was the bad news that the family was uh, expecting at that moment in time. Uh, they said that the only way that 
we can release him into the hands of the Almighty. And uh, they will start to reduce the sedation and all the medication in the body. And truly, to whatever Professor Mukokong has said that we are making him to suffer, we saw that at the ultimate end. Uh, on Saturday last week, because of uh, whatever that we saw there, it was not a very good sight. It was a very bad sight. He was bleeding uh, through his ears, nose, and mouth. It was a very bad sight. We accepted and said that uh, because of when we pray, we say, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Uh, he passed on around 20 past 11 midnight on that Saturday. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tsepo. Uh, on behalf of the communicators in government and also the members of the media would like to express our deepest condolences. As you can see in this room, uh, Ronnie had touched a lot of us. I think we are still in a bit of shock. As the foreign press in South Africa, we often occupy a more marginal position than our domestic colleagues, not caught up in the daily cycle of morning TV bulletins or drive time radio roundups. On the downside, this means that we're sometimes confused bystanders to the increasingly convoluted South African story. It also makes it harder for us to strike up strong relationships with top officials and their spokesmen and spokeswomen. In both of these respects, Ronnie was an exception. Warm-hearted, respectful, and generous of his time and knowledge, Ronnie was always happy to fill in the gaps for the bewildered outsider, in many cases supplementing his titbits, advice and background with an offer of a quick chat with top officials, including most recently the DP. Before that, during the dark days of the xenophobic violence in 2008, as Home Affairs spokesman, he would unfailingly take calls at any time of day and night, on any day of the week, fielding questions politely, respectfully, and as accurately as he could. It pains me to say that in South Africa today, there are many government departments where this is not the case. For Ronnie, openness and transparency were a must, without which our bread, the suspicion and distrust that now permeates so many aspects of public life in the democracy that he fought so tirelessly to build. It is worth remembering that prominent among the cluster of officials who led President Nelson Mandela to cast his first vote as a 76-year-old man at the Ochlanger High School in Durban in 1994 was Ronnie Ramwepa. Above all else, in all the foreign media's dealings with Ronnie, he was first and foremost a person, sharing a common interest and in humanity that transcended the sometimes awkward barriers that can exist between reporter and reported. As Reuters Bureau Chief, it's very sad that the last time I spoke in person to Ronnie was a couple of months ago, just after he delivered a heartfelt and beautifully written eulogy on behalf of Deputy President Ramaphosa at the Memorial of Judah and Gwenya one of the finest photographers who has ever worked for Reuters on the African continent. To be standing here now doing the same for Ronnie, who also was plucked too soon from our midst, is not right or fair. Ronnie, from all in the Foreign Press Corps in South Africa, you will be sorely missed. Truly, you are one of the good guys. I have a difficult job of talking about Ronnie Mamuepa a wonderful gentleman who was larger than life. He loved and he was loved. He was a friend of us in the fourth estate and a friend of his colleagues in government communications. 
He was also a colleague to his principals and bosses because he was a politician in his own right. And he never let that go to his head. Humble to the core, he treated everybody equally. He was a special, special gentleman. He is part of a special generation of spokespeople. Pax Mankatlani, Joel Nechitenje, Temba Maseko, Peggy Kumalo, Mjongwa, who wrote a beautiful, beautiful tribute about Roni in the Star on Monday sharing a number of stories about the special communicator that this professional will talk about, this patriot was. He had a lot of special skills. In addition to his special heart, he had charisma, which he used almost all the time when he had to break through to send a government message. He never allowed his frustrations with the media when we got things wrong, as we sometimes do to get in the way of the message. His other tool was his knowledge level. We all in the media have had the opportunity to drink from his well of wisdom. He could hold his own on important matters in public policy, from economic development to foreign relations. He was very sharp, yet very patient. He raised the bar in terms of public service. He gave us a benchmark to measure ourselves and our colleagues on the other side of the communications divide. What Ronnie was not, he was not a populist, and he was not a groupie. His job was never to handle the social media accounts of his principals. His job was never to run around and behind politicians carrying their handbags, shielding them from public scrutiny. He was never a gatekeeper. He gave us great access to the politi politicians he saved. I remember he organized a briefing, a meeting between the government, led by the Deputy President Cyril Ramaphosa and Sanef, where we had a wonderful opportunity to interact with the Deputy President and a number of ministers. And halfway through the meeting, and because journalists are trained initially to ask questions and sometimes fail to engage and interact as we interrogate, we asked a number of questions, and Ronnie uh, got annoyed with us. And he grabbed the mic and said, I'm sorry to remind you, this is not an ele elevated press conference. And we were all properly rebuked. Because he was comfortable in his own skin, and he had authority to do these things. And we respected him. Uh, we listened to him. He understood politics because he was a politician in himself. He understood the values of this great nation, where we're from, and the principles and the pillars of the Constitution, taking it back to the Freedom Charter, because he understood these things. He lived them. He's not Most of those of my generation drank from Roni's fountain of knowledge. But Roni impressed me the most when President Mandela was campaigning during the local government elections in Kwamakuta in 1996, when I worked for some Bandistan TV station, <laughs> back then, okay. there was a ring of steel at the stadium which was teeming with security personnel, given the nature of the political violence that had gripped KwaZulu Natal um, in those years. And there had also been a massacre in Kwamakuta called the Kwamakuta Massacre. The stadium was tense. 
police had formed a human shield that separated the crowd from the political principals on stage. And now because of the security situation and the audio quality was poor, and journalists couldn't get what Madiba was saying. So some of us approached Roni and said to him that we wanted a word with Madiba. It was a mammoth task. But Roni, being Roni, saved the day. He allowed us access to the old man, much to the annoyance of the security personnel. I remember overhearing one of the presidential protection unit member saying to Roni, Roni, do your job and we'll do ours. He wasn't chuffed with Roni at all. But Roni understood his role very well, that of being the conduit between the media and his principal. And he executed that duty with a prom. Roni was not a gatekeeper. I'm not coping for your speech, um, Kokeli, I, I had it. <laughs> <laughs> Ronnie was not a gatekeeper, he was a facilitator. Ronnie did not make the news, he delivered the news. The entirely so. But we learned from that. Very important. Ronnie represented what I call old school. Now, some of you, when you talk of old school, you're thinking of old school music, the quiet door and bubble gum and all of that. <laughs> but the old school I'm talking about is the old school of communication. There was nothing superlative about him. He just stuck to the basics. He comprehended the symbiotic relationship between the media and government. He understood that we needed the media in a much as the media needed us. This morning, I woke up to a moving tribute by journalist and friend, Juvel Randao, which he posted on Facebook, to which I was tagged. And I want to quote a line or so. He wrote, Randao, Mamwepa was not good, but excellent in his sometimes thankless job. One of Mamwepa's beautiful strengths, in addition to his amazing ability, was his humility. He was happy to be the prince without wanting to be king. He was happy to serve South Africa without expecting reward. Roni knew his political home, but as a senior public servant, he never publicly exhibited his political colors in carrying out his duties. He was able to distinguish between party and state. Farewell, my brother, mentor, colleague, friend. May your departed soul rest in eternal peace and rise in glory. Thank you. And then I looked through the contacts there and I called the man called Ronnie Mam Weber no I'm Tepo from Bob Broadcasting. Okay, I know it basically. He was so warm for the first time. I want to talk to Peter Mukaba about to add no about this kill the well kill the farmer thing. <laughs> Are you serious? Are you a journalist, girl? No, I'm still an intern. Oh, but who's your editor? Why can't you send your editor? <laughs> girl, no, I, sh I just want to do and see and speak to the man. Ar no, 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 you are very junior. Which year can Molella say, ah, no, no, no. <laughs> Get your degree and come back to Little House. <laughs> After that, I said, OK, I'll give me your number. I gave him my number. There was no cell phone. I didn't have a cell phone. After about two hours, he calls me back. Are, are you still want to talk to Peter? Kerry, yes, it was a, it was a Wednesday. Are, give me your editor's number. I gave him my editor's number. And Ronnie called them and said, I want this man to come. He must drive to Joburg. I came to Joburg. He gave me an appointment. Come on Monday. I drove 
from Afikeng to, to, to Shell House then. I didn't know Joe Beck. I came with the cameraman. I was doing TV that particular time. I arrived there, it's at 12 o'clock, Monday. I arrived at the Tule House then, Shell, Shell House. After 2 p.m., I was in his office with, uh, with, with something like this, with Madiba's face, that, that office, that famous office of his. And then came Peter Mugaba. Talk to this boy. Hey, man. <laughs> Peter, who's this boy? No, he's a journalist from Bob Broadcasting. Are you, 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 you. I don't want to talk to Bansustan uh, organization. No. He was, hey, I say, I direct you. Talk to this man. Peter didn't believe it. And I said, yeah, this guy uh, set up the cameras. And then he sat down. What are we talking about? And then we spoke about the long history. I got the interview. And then before I left, Peter said, Tepo, come here. I'm planning to come and over, over 10 Muso Wamangope, you must come and cover me. <laughs> <laughs> I need your numbers. He took me. That was the beginning of the relationship I had with Peter Mukaba through Ronnie Mamweba. And I'm thankful for that and for that, for the rest is history. So my message in closing is that the spear has fallen. The great son of the soil is no more. Throughout his life, he really espoused high ethical conduct, a man always brimming with broad smile, able to reach out to like what Mukokil said, what has been described as a hostile press, the man who was able to really mend bridges and also make sure that uh, he really develop good working relations, not only with the media, but his staff, members of the diplomatic call, like I said, and leaders of, leaders of opposition parties, by the way, if you really uh, followed on their responses, it was like they know, they acknowledge his contribution. So to me, I say, in memory of uh, Ronnie, I think some, many things have been said. One, I would quote in closing, a journalist who has not had many opportunities to interact with Braroni. Kaya Kumalu from ENCA said we need to have an academy of communicators named after Roni. And what I can tell you is a good suggestion. And one of the things, an interaction I had with Braroni, where he nearly cried, came to tears, was when we were at the Sifaka Makhato building, before it was he started working where Derko is based now, OR Chambo building. He took me by the hand and said, Tepo, let's go back at the Makato and say, you saw this bold building. I can die peacefully now. This is the work that we've put there. I'm happy that we have our head office, this caliber of a head office that is a state of the art. And I think maybe our authorities should also consider maybe naming some of those auditoriums or, or, or boardrooms after this gentle giant. So to the family, we'll always uh, remember Braroni. He has inspired us, and I think we'll take his legacy forward. Roni taught me that it is not the press conference. The press conference is just one, is part of the process that uh, you have achieved or accomplished your task when the story is written and it's in a prominent uh, uh, space in the, in, the, in, the, in the newspaper or in, the, in radio or any other broadcast media. But that's also not enough that the message, the message must be closest to the message that you intended to communicate. If you fail that, you can have 100 people in a press conference and they write things that are not related to your message uh, and you look bad in whatever is written, then you still have not achieved anything. So what's the challenge then? We used to spend a lot of time talking to journalists in the background. 
So Ronnie used to say, you see, Chief, we are writing this statement, we'll issue it. And they may or may not use it. But we must talk to them. And he says, there are things that we need to explain which we may not be able to say in the statement. So one of the things, you know, as we were in the ANC Youth League, we used to read a lot and we used to hear a lot of things uh, being said about the ANC. And there was the issue, the problem of leaks. So people were saying, you know, this, so every communicator, one, mes one lesson that we must then learn from Ronnie is that every communicator must make themselves the most reliable source of information. So the issue, whether they write the story and attribute it to you or not, I'm saying even those that they write for non-attribution or for anonymous sources, that source must be you. You must be worried if you are not that source and you call yourself a communicator. Remember, and of course, one of the things then that I need to say about Ronnie is that he always thought about improving communication, of course, through the media. So he would never be satisfied. For him, so, so he would say, okay, whatever we achieved today, we achieved. What about tomorrow? What should the newspapers write about us, say about us tomorrow, or radio, or anybody else, other media? And we would think and find a way to get things uh, out in the media. Um, and then we would go on and implement those. When he came to government, he did the same thing. He continued the same way. He went to work at the Department of Foreign Affairs. In June, I made a call to Roni, so one of the I think that was our last conversation. And he was worried about um, everything that is happening in the country today. And he said, from a communications point of view, we need to do something about it. <coughs> so we were discussing, and uh, he said to me, unfortunately, I'm not well, so we can't meet now. And then we agreed that we would meet when he's well enough. But he said to me, how do we deal with this thing? Because uh, we are not at GCIS and we don't uh, hold positions. But that should not stop us from intervening. And he then said uh, me and him would uh, go and speak to Minister Dlodlo. And he said, if I don't do it, you do it. But sadly, we never got to do that. I didn't do it, so I failed him. But maybe there's still time to redeem myself. Rest in peace, Roni. Upo Droni was all about solutions. He was not petty in his views. He was always honest. And his views, whether they were uh, good or bad, one thing I know, they came from a good place. That was Upudroni. Upudroni embodied the true values of a public service. He had a way of maintaining calm in the midst of a chaos. He was what every communicator should aspire to be. <coughs> In the sense that he wanted to fit with people from all generations. I mean, when he was with me, he would change his jargon, his mannerisms, he would even change, you know, accent, just to make me comfortable. 
In fact, Ubudroni was just all about making people comfortable. He was adaptive. I'm not sure how many people uh, of his caliber would make me laugh the way Ubudroni did. He was simply an amazing, and um, he was simply amazing. Um, there isn't one instance when I was in his company that I wouldn't learn a thing or two. <coughs> Obudroni had a way of imparting knowledge without being intimidating or overwhelming. He didn't behave like a Mr. Know-it-all guy, you know, because he's just a Mr. Know-it-all guy, he's intimidating. Obudroni was just not that. Obudroni uh, wasn't about self-glory. One thing he taught me, Obudroni, was to stay away from drama and simply focus on my work and compete with no one. Obudroni once said to me, Joy, do not be distracted. Empower yourself with knowledge. Forget the side shows and remember that you are here to be of service to the country and to the people of South Africa. It is not about you, Joy. And I'll always remember that. In closing, I might not be half of the communicator Obudroni was, but one thing I know is that I have taken a leaf out of his book, and I'm determined to serve and be counted, counted among those who want to see South Africa prosper. Obudroni loved East South Africa. Obudroni loved the government. And I sincerely hope that as civil servants, we could do the same to better serve this beautiful country of ours. And go see Budroni game from the Sozako Zonge, Silaseke, Luka Hulumente, Bessie Jonge, Ufunda, Luku, Lukue, Unga, Umoya Wako, Unga Pumla, Ugos. This obsession of Ronnie with communication, where did it start? And I'm now convinced that uh, it started very early on. Ronnie ended up in jail because he believed his story about wanting to go and become an MK soldier has to be told as soon as he crossed the border. So he liaised with Tami Mkwanazi, may his soul rest in peace, and they arranged, pictures were taken, uh, interviews were done, and once Ronnie and the gang had crossed whatever the river is, whatever the uh, <clears throat> fence is, they would send a message back and Tammy would have his scoop. So <clears throat> we may interrogate the intelligence of wanting to do that, uh, but let's park that for a while and just look at Ronnie organizing this story uh, at that age. Um, <clears throat> and Tami, of course, was uh, playing along. Um, in Chivenda, we would say for Tami and uh, Ronnie, so, because I know that uh, <clears throat> you are illiterate. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> I will translate that. Mademanamkoro just means they are one and the same. So Tami also bought into this scoop uh, uh, thing to the point where he discussed this scoop that was coming with Zelake on the phone. Now his partner at the time, Amanda Kwadi, may his soul rest in peace, may her soul rest in peace, says to Tami, but you can't discuss these things on the phone. Tami says, no, Mara, kibua <laughs> gasut. <clears throat> and Amanda says to Tami, but at Protea, there is a white cop called so-and-so who knows Soto Palalue. Tami says, no, 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 no. So the, the short version of the story is that as uh, Ronnie tries to create this scoop by going, they are nabbed, tried, ends up on Robben Island with Tami. And at the trial of all of them, the tape uh, of the phone conversation, it's played, and the interpreter from Sesotho to English for the court is the white cop from Proteus. <laughs> <clears throat> but I'm really just saying, 
from way back, Ronnie was into telling the story uh, all the way. As a government communicator, uh, Ronnie had principles and was very protective of those principles. Protective without being inhibitive. He would, if you say to Ronnie, I want an interview, you'll interview Ronnie first because he'll want to know what exactly and where is this story going to run? When? Uh, well, you, you, you work for Media24, so is this story also going to run in Rapport and uh, News24 and here and here and here? Uh, <clears throat> because if I'm going to give you this opportunity, I must also get my, my thing. So it was not enough for Roni that you want an interview and he will just facilitate it. He, want, he would make sure that he got his pound of flesh in return. And uh, Murare, <laughs> uh, because I'm going to go around the maple tree now, um, you did your bit. Um, you didn't do spin, you did communication. Um, you owe us nothing. The harrowing story by Tsepo the younger brother, it's enough for us to say, you owe us nothing. You suffered to the end, and we should really release you, because eternal peace is due for you. Thank you. Now, many of you here, many of you women who are here, you are very unlucky if you've never been kissed by Ronnie. <laughs> But uh, Ronnie will kiss uh, any woman, even in the presence of the husband. Uh, and Ronnie, when you travel with him through the commercial uh, airports, you know, it was better if we use water cloth. If you travel with him through the commercial airports, you really will struggle and you will miss your flight because he's meeting and kissing and kissing everybody. <laughs> But in retrospect, it shows how compassionate Mamweba was. He was a very compassionate you know, man. I called him Mamweba. I never called him by the you know, first name. He had respect for me and the, the authority, though we were the same level as DDG, but he had so much respect. And he always called me chief of staff. He never used my first name. I never liked it. But for him, he thought it was part and parcel of the authority and respecting the position you have. And I called him Mamweba because he was older than me. But this was a compassionate man, and many of the people in this room uh, will, will know that. Uh, Ronnie will worry about every person who is dead in Atrashville and will miss very important assignment and said, no, I need to go and bury this person and will always tell you a story about that, about that person. And in the conversation we've had and all the experiences with Mam Weber, one comes to one conclusion, that this was a humane man uh, who was very humble, who understood that the totality of his life was part of a bigger uh, canvas made up of different pieces which each one of you who are gathered here today made a contribution to. So it was the highest, you know, ultimate epitome of what it means to be human and to be humane as he always treated other people uh, with, with care. I have to mention this because in the nature of the work that we do, we hardly spend time at home with the children and family. I'm yet to meet a man who speaks and praises his wife as much as Ronnie did. Because every day he tells you about Madame. You know, every day. And I mean, I, I think I take my hat off to him and it shows how compassionate and the type of the relationship we had. And we thank the family and the, the spouse in particular for giving us Ronnie and taking care of him. Thank you. Thank you for this memorial service, honoring a gallant freedom fighter a time-tested public servant, a seasoned government communicator par excellence, Roni Mamwepa. A gathering of government communicators and the media is in itself 
a special tribute to this humble, calm, patient, cheerful, approachable, gently human, down to earth, and most likable patriot and servant of the people, Comrade Roni. He spent most of his life among communicators and reporters serving the people. But it is to address Rooney otherwise. It is simple and adoring Rooney as he wanted it to be. Not Mr. Mamwepa or TTG, even in his position as Communications Deputy Director General at Home Affairs from 2011. He wouldn't accept any title. He preferred to be called Roni. This should begin to explain the person he truly was. He was down to earth and he was unassuming. Upon his shoulders, needle rests the accolades, men of the people, a leader who had no title, a true servant of the masses. Yeah. Program director, an important lesson for me is how he handled the media. He had this ability to understand the product itself, as we have said, Dr. Chip. Whether a civic or an immigration issue. And he understood clearly the needs of the different segments of this audience. The youth, the women and men, the elderly, the business, and the foreign national. One of the concepts I learned from him is the form and content of a media briefing. He taught us to distinguish an off-the-record briefing from an on-the-record briefing, and so on. The beauty of it all was in the fact that there should be no room for a spin, for dishonesty, or worst of all, for a lie. You could see he learned from the best. He was quite clear on the role of the media, understanding that the media questions must be answered with all honesty and integrity. If he goes to my PA, I said, hey, there is a, 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 a in, my, in my program, I've got this appointment today. He will say, no, no, push that, push that away. This is what I want to deal with it. This is to disseminate information to the people through the media, a powerful medium for distributing information to the populace. He believed and lived the saying that it takes two to tango. He wanted feedback on communication efforts, and thus for him, media monitoring was critical to test the impact of communication drive. This is another important lesson I learned from Roni. When, for him, internal communication was also a key. Departmental officials as ambassadors must be informed. Indeed, it was a question of deploying internal means of communicating to complement what you do externally. At home affairs, we'll sit with your cell phone and you listen. I am Minister Nkosa Zanatla, Minister Zuma. Then you start say, yes, Minister. Because you are thinking it's the Minister calling. That is the message which Ronit did and is sending to every staff member in the department. That's what you were talking about and say, it was to change the department, not just about communication. In these schemes of things, synergy is also critical in running the communication machinery of minister and that of deputy minister as well as of the department. He believed that there must be one communication in the department. Lastly, on behalf of the department, our minister, deputy minister, and public servants, I convey our heartfelt condolences to Roni's family, Audrey, his children, his siblings, and to the entire family colleagues, friends, and comrades across the length and breadth of our beloved uh, republic. At Home Affairs, we were hoping one day he will return to finish the work he started to transform our communication. On excellent in government communication, without Roni, we are left poorer. 
We will remember him as a militant, loyal, and a committed servant of the people who was fortified by years on Robben Island at very young age. With the men who were shocked by his untimely departure on Saturday at Unista Hospital, who were saying, your loss is our loss. Lastly, Ronnie, I know, was a gift for all. Communicators at Home Affairs always say they learned a lot from him. I, for one, did learn much from him. Farewell to the Dean of Communicators. Stalandwe, I take my hat off for you, Ronnie. You know, I looked up the dictionary yesterday in putting together my speech. At 12.05, I sent it to the office just to check spelling and other things. And I found a few words like sedulous, efficient, productive, committed, diligent, industrious, assiduous, tireless. These are the few words that describe Ronnie Mamwepa's attitude to work and duty. Cheerful, chirpy, contented, delectable, enraptured, exuberant, humorous, invigorating, mirthful, wacky, zingy, and just plain pleasant. The list to describe his infectious character and approach to life does not even begin to do justice to, de to describe Ronnie's character. On Sunday, the 23rd of July, South Africans retired af for the night after receiving the tragic news of the death of this human being, a beautiful human being, a struggle veteran, a dedicated civil servant, Mr. Ronnie Mamweb. Actually, Comrade Ronnie, to me, a humble, disciplined, and dedicated champion of our people. Ronnie first came to prominence as a young teenage activist, like all of us, in the late 70s and 80s, and was eventually jailed and served time on Robben Island. He was a fierce and dedicated freedom fighter who never took a step back in fighting for the cause of liberation, justice, and freedom. During his lifetime, Ronnie served in many capacities but wherever he served, he sought to make a difference. He was fearless, dedicated, extremely hardworking. He would and could not rest until a job was done. Many fellow government communicators here today will no doubt remember being called to action by Ronnie. Ronnie didn't care where you worked. Whether you were in the Department of Health, you were in the Department of Health, because he felt he had to mentor and guide all of us. He didn't care whether I was a minister. Ronnie felt he had to mentor and guide me too, because he was, of course, better than me in communications. Many of you today grew under the tutelage of this captivating storyteller. He was meticulous in his approach and insisted to those who worked with him to give their best at all times and more. He delivered excellence and superior communications products and expected the same from all of us, including colleagues from the media. But I lived in the comforting hope that he would recover soon. I held on to a false belief, and I was happy with my false belief, that Ronnie was the type that was made to recover quickly, because life was a little slower with Ronnie in hospital. Actually, life was a lot slower with Ronnie in hospital. I was told of a story when a few years back, Ronnie took ill and was in hospital for a few weeks. When he came out, a certain colleague, happy to welcome him back, said, Ronnie, welcome back. You gave us such a fright there. We thought you were gone. Ronnie, in his usual wit, responded, my boy, don't wish for that day because at my funeral, you won't have access. It will be so big that the only person for you, way for you to gain entry will be if you are an ANC marshal or carrying an ANC Youth League banner marching in front of the house. We will see that on Saturday. Ronnie was always like, you know, I think all of you know, you know from time to time, Uroni was like a citrus soda. I'm sure all of you have experienced a citrus soda from time to time. He was effervescent, 
robust, strong, and it just brought a sense of calm and relief in sad and uncomfortable moments and situations. I knew I would never visit him in hospital when I heard he was in a coma. I was never going to do that. And I could not, I just could not fathom a still and quiet Roni. It wouldn't have been Roni for me, and I didn't want to experience that. That was a sight that would have scared, frightened, and distorted my view of this lively character I got to know and love. I will forever remember his warm smile, including his kiss, Busani. I was one of the lucky ones that always got a kiss from him. His open and welcoming nature, as well as his deep intellect and critical thinking. Government communicators and the media fraternity joined the nation in mourning the passing of Roni Mamwepa and sends sincere condolences for this loss. He was a stalwart of the liberation struggle, a dedicated and humble servant, and a loving husband, father, brother, and a friend. Roni was a true, loyal, and dependable friend to many. I remember traveling back to Johannesburg with him from Comrade Collins Chabani's funeral. He coaxed me into abandoning my transport and traveled back with him and Comrade Faisal. This is one of the things I did not declare. <laughs> the lift that I got from Faisal and Ronnie Mamweba. He spoke most of the way on that journey. This week, I will bury another friend, comrade and colleague, who comforted me in that time of great sadness and loss. This week, I honor and pay tribute to another friend and colleague who placed people before self. I know I can say that the thoughts and prayers of the nation are with the Mamwepa family. My condolences to the ANC, Ronnie's political home, from when he was a child until his untimely death. Ronnie may have passed on, but his legacy lives on, and his contribution to our country will never be forgotten. On behalf of government, the Government Communicators Forum, and on behalf of colleagues in the media space, I would like to call on all South Africans to join us as we pay tribute to a life well lived in dignity and in honor. Ronnie and countless others of his generation lived to serve the people of South Africa. Ronnie represented a generation of those who gave up their childhood and youth for a life of struggle to ensure the liberation of all South Africans when there was no prospect of reward or recognition. There were no salaries, there were no bonuses, there were no fringe benefits. The only thing you faced was imprisonment or death. We owe it to the sacrifices of Ronnie and countless others to protect and expand on the many social and economic gains that we have made since 1994. We should never forget the role played by Ronnie and others in helping us to move from a repressive regime to a society built on the values of human rights, dignity, and democracy. It is up to us to carry this legacy by shaping a national identity and consciousness that is built on mutual respect, tolerance, and acceptance. Our country undoubtedly has many challenges. However, Ronnie and millions of others continue to fight and work for a better and more inclusive nation. He taught us the values of humility, sacrifice, and service. Friends, we have a choice to make. We can either do nothing or hope that someone else will be the change we want to see. Or like Ronnie, we can take the proverbial bull by the horns, lead and become the change we want to see. The sacrifices of Ronnie and others has brought us this far, but there is still more to be done. Let us get to work and together build the nation of our collective dreams. Rest in peace, my comrade, my friend, my fellow fighter. You will be sorely missed. We will remember that every time, and especially when we walk into the GCIS Media Center, which will now be called the Ronnie Mamwepa Medium Center. Thank you.